Welcome to the uh, Board of County Commissioners Board work session. And again, this is a, a session on budget. And uh, I'm John Hutchings, the, uh, the chair of the board. We have the vice chair, Commissioner Ty Manser. We have the county manager, Romero Chavez, and the assistant county manager, Robin Campbell. Uh, we also are uh, guested by the county treasurer, Jeff Gatman. <laughs> that wasn't funny. Um, and we've got Denise uh, Doty and uh, Patty Rosetto and <coughs> Olivia uh, Outman. So welcome. Did I miss anybody? Uh, Amy Davis, the clerk of the board? No, she's not here, but Commissioner Edwards just joined us. That's close enough. Commissioner Edwards is here. Okay. So, Robin, go ahead and pick it up where you left off, if you please. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, we are back with uh, budget presentations. And we are kicking off this afternoon with the treasurer. So um, happy to have our treasurer, Jeff Gadman, with us today. And I'm going to turn it over to him. I would tell the board that in your binder, the um, very first page in the binder has the tab numbers. The offices and departments are in alphabetical order. And the treasurer is under 24. tab 24. Let's see if that looks right. Take it away, Jeff. All right. Thank you, commissioners and other distinguished guests. I am Jeff Gadman, Thurston County Treasurer. Still want to find out what somebody found humorous about that as I was being introduced, but <laughs> that couldn't have been time better if we tried. <laughs> um, so I, I want to start by saying that the numbers, the budget request that I've given to you is extremely conservative. Um, because of some of the uncertainty uh, about the economy, I assumed that we would all be asked to maintain our budgets with the 2% cuts in place. And um, while that does allow me room, in budget room to operate, if I have a catastrophic equipment failure in my office, like a copier blows up, uh, it could be problematic. So if the commissioners see fit to um, at, to give us our 2% back, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, <clears throat> one of the things, if you look at page two of my presentation after the header page, it's basically lists, this is an, an overview of what the county treasurer is responsible for. Um, receiving and accounting of revenue, collection of the taxes, disbursement of funds, uh, responsible for cash management, debt management, and investment portfolio management. In addition to that, I've got over 50 customers in the form of local special purpose districts and tax districts, such as fire districts, school districts, uh, and that sort of thing that I do all of those same functions for. Uh, so there's a lot of responsibility and I take my job very, very seriously. And the thing with the taxing districts I have, so I've got two sets of customers. I got taxing districts and I've got the public. And my obligation to both of them is equal and cannot be abridged. And I take that very, very seriously. Uh, on the uh, investment portfolio this year, our investment portfolio is actually right now over a billion dollars. Um, that's a pretty impressive number. So if you look at page three now uh, for funds managed by the office and the department, um, we haven't changed the number of FTEs since the beginning of this last biennium when I increased FTEs by 0.1 <clears throat> from 12.5 to 12.6, and the 12.6 does include myself. Uh, going uh, 2019 budget, 2020 budget, and 2021, the uh, 2019, 1,175 and change. 
2020, 1,262,000 million two sixty two in change, and asking for one million two sixty eight in change for twenty twenty one. And like I said, if we could add the two percent back to that, that would be greatly appreciated. Just to give some cushion, um, you can look back at my history, and, and Robin will verify this that I give back money every year, and I am not one that feels like I need to spend down to last dime so that I get the same amount next year. Uh, but I do like to have an operating cushion, like I said. Now, if I have a copier blow up on me, that's an $18,000 hit to the budget that I got to find room for somewhere else. Um, and I don't always get it in uh, salary savings because my staff seems to like working here and they don't leave. Uh, um, so I'm get, I'm sorry to interrupt, Jeff. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. It's got the presentation on okay. it. Okay. So I'll just do that. And I trust Jeff implicitly, but verify he does give money back every year. That's his history. Uh, the treasurer's office has never been overspent under Jeff's um, leadership. Beautiful. Yeah, I think the the least I've given back is eleven. The most I've given back is close to 60. So, wow. That's, uh, actually, I did that for public consumption, Jeff. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, the REIT Fund 1160 is a fund that's shared by the assessor and the treasurer. It's in my office. Uh, this is the $5 REIT fee. And this just tells you uh, where we're at, where we expect to be at at the end of 2021. Um, Right now, the way that, so, so the assessor's office asks for a parking place in this fund every year to help fund one of his positions. And so um, there's going to be fluctuations every year because sometimes he needs to use what he's reserved uh, in this fund and sometimes he doesn't. But it's fed, it's fed about Thirty-eight to forty-five thousand dollars per year. Uh, this year, we're down a little bit on the total number of REIT transactions. Although July and August were our second and third uh, highest quantity REIT months since 2005. So uh, there's a lot of activity out there in terms of real estate transactions. Uh, as long as the interest rates stay low, I anticipate that will continue to happen. You know, when the interest rates uh, dip below 4%, so let me, let me back up a little bit. Back in 2011, 2012, 2013, there was a lot of incentive to refinance your mortgage because uh, rates had gone down to 35 to 4%. Well, as rates went up over the next ensuing years, part of the uh, shortage of housing inventory in the last couple of years has been because interest rates were higher than what people owned right now. And why would I sell my 375 mortgage to go buy a house in a, in a 480 or 490 uh, market? Well, now interest rates have dipped. And, and in fact, this morning, 30-year uh, rates are down to 3.05. So I anticipate that's what that's done is, is it, it has given people a reason to throw their house on the market because when they buy their new house, they're going to be able to get a mortgage that they can still afford. Uh, going on to the next page. Thank you, Robin. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I have, and it's an ongoing challenge, is the county population, the county parcel count continue to grow, which means the number of transactions my office has to process continues to grow. And with the existing number of FTEs I have, we can still do that, uh, but I don't know how much longer. Uh, we are not, not super close to needing to ask for another person, but this last year, uh, my leadership sheet my leadership team and myself have started mumbling amongst ourselves about when we might see the need to come and ask. Uh, I don't anticipate in the next three or four years having to add to my staff, 
but I just want to make the board aware that this this is one of the challenges that we have in my office. Uh, the next slide, I have requested no policy level proposals for the 2021 budget year. And I would be happy to entertain any questions you may have. Uh, Commissioner Edwards? Yes, sir. Uh, Jeff, if we gave you back your 2%, would you say there's a good chance we're going to get most of it back in the ending fund balance? Yes. Okay. Commissioner Minster, any questions? Jeff, I was going to ask you a couple questions about page. I don't know if it's in front of you, but it, it's the. I don't know how to even describe the page. It is the second page of your budget report. Um, Robin, is that something we can show him or does he have the same binder we have? Um, so he submitted the um, all of the pages that you have in your binder. Which one the are one, you? the one with two? It's mainly two graphs. Two graphs. It's got the blue and green bars at the top, where it's kind of like you've tabbed it in other places. Um, the budget pages, the second page of the budget pages. Yeah, that's the one okay. that Hutch is holding up. Oh, that. Um, His budget snapshot, I did those just like a little graph. So, Olivia, would you be able to share that? Yeah. Those are the pages that go in the budget book. Yeah, no problem. One so, moment. Olivia made those little, made the graphs? Is that the? Yeah, it's just a little Excel sheet where I put in how many FTEs um, and then their budget overall funds for the last four or five years. Let me find it. Well, okay, so I'll just make two. One is a comment, just kind of partly tongue in cheek, but the graph at the bottom, it shows, you know, it, it graphically, it looks like you had this massive jump in staff, but it's it's a 0 0.1 FTE. Yeah. The way it's scaled. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah, going to just was tease you and say you're not doing yourself any favors, but I guess it's <laughs> Olivia's fault. No, it's my <laughs> fault. It is. I saw that too, and I was cringing a second ago, but I'm going to. That was on me. Well, that okay. point one was an extremely important, an important point one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'll fix that. Thank you. The, the top graph, though, um, it shows your treasurer budget all funds from 17 to 21 through 21. And I was just wondering, it looks like there was a drop of over $2 million from 17 to 18, which was like more than 20% of your budget. I was it looks like Denise that. has that. Denise, what's um, that it's, about, a, about? it's a bond. It was a bond payoff. Oh, okay. Right. So that so, was all okay. funds, not just the general fund. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All of the, all of the debt service runs through my budget as well. So like the $1.268 million, that's the general fund portion of my budget that I'm, that's my operating budget. Yeah. In addition to that, there's another 6.4 million that's used for debt service that um, it'll show up as part of the total budget that I have, but it's managed by Robin and her staff. Okay. Just want to make sure I understood that. That's all I have for you, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah. And um, Jeff, I don't have any questions. They've, they've been answered already. Very good. Okay, I, I'm done. The two um, percent. Okay, so that two percent would help, and it would probably be revert. Some of it revert back. Yes. No, that was my question. Okay. Yes, unless both copiers blow up. Yeah. <laughs> then all bets are off. <laughs> okay. And that's why you have no policy requests at this time. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you all very much for your time, and I hope you enjoy this afternoon. We got done a little early, so step outside and take advantage of the sunshine. So before you get away, may I ask a question about the budget drivers? Absolutely. So we have the ratio of electronic <laughs> property tax payments to total property tax payments. And in 2019, what I think this is telling me is that only... 
26.9% of the property tax payments were made electronically. Does that sound about right to you? Yes. Is there a way or are you um, uh, trying to increase that percentage? Would you yes. say that growth went up with COVID? I do. And uh, so from the first half, I, I don't want to report out what happened in the first half because that might be skewed because we were closed to the public. Totally. So after this payment month, then I'll have a pretty good indication of uh, how COVID affected that activity. Uh, because the, the growth every year has been fairly steady, continues to grow. But what I'm hoping we'll see at, at the end of this month is that our electronic payment activity is over 30%. Is there anything that um, the board or the county could do to help you increase those numbers? So that's an interesting question. I hadn't really thought about that. You know, I promote the electronic payments on the website uh, and I promote them every year with the tax statements, <clears throat> promoting the, the paperless bills. We're getting a lot more activity on that. Um, if you, you know, wanted to add a banner onto the county's main homepage, uh, that would encourage the, you know, hey, did you know you could pay your taxes like this? And then maybe put a link on there that goes into our pay property taxes portal. That would be awesome. Do Anything most, we can uh, do to publicize it. Do most mortgage companies do it electronically? Yes. Okay. And that's over 50, 55% of our property taxes. Wow, good. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Now, oh, I, and I want to say that that 26.9% does not include the electronic service from the mortgage companies. That's just private people going in and signing up. Go ahead, Gary. Does it cost more to the citizen to pay that electronically than drop a check in the mail? There's no difference. No difference. Okay. How about Unless they're paying, if they're paying by credit card, there is a 2.35 percent fee yeah and there's a flat fee for using a visa debit but if you use it's called an e-check and it's an electronic check there is no charge okay so if i were to come into your office and pay with my credit card would i get that same credit card fee or is that only online that is also in the office yeah there's no if you pay online versus coming into the office to pay, it doesn't matter how you pay, there's no difference. And that's a county policy, countywide, I believe. That was a county, county policy put into place, uh, recommended by my predecessor, yes. And it's a good policy. Uh, one, one other thing, when a party does not pay their property tax on time, they're assessed a penalty and interest, uh, by the time that goes through the process and they miss that payment, it shows up as late. In the end, how much do we bring in uh, extra because of the interest and penalties? I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have that number handy because the money goes into the general fund. Do you have that off the top of your head, Robin? I can look that up pretty quickly it's so it's a fairly significant amount yeah yes it is so i think your revenue picture is better than what we might think do, do, do. sorry it's going to take me a minute to okay i don't i don't need that answer now i the answer given is satisfactory but i would like to know it at some point okay, and then we'll move on Anything else, Treasurer? I've got nothing. Uh, Romero, uh, anybody have any questions of Jeff? No, sir. Uh, I would like to just comment. Thank you, Jeff, for all your effort on getting disposed of uh, property and getting it back, back on the tax rolls. 
that makes a big difference to the taxpayers. You're welcome. And uh, I, I actually enjoy doing it. That's one of the, I always like a new challenge. And uh, this is it's one of those challenging things. How do we market this? And uh, so thank you for allowing me to pull that into my office because, like I said, it's been a lot of fun. Well, I'll tell you, you are the right person in the right job at the right time as well. You're a good selection to come from Lacey. Thank you. Excellent selection. Thank you. Thank you all very much. All right. Thank you, Jeff. See you soon. Okay. All Bye, right. everybody. Bye-bye. Okay, well, this wraps up the first presentation a little early, which is very nice. And we start the next one, which is the assessor at 2.30. So I have the assessor waiting. On the, oh, good. So I don't know if he would like to move forward with that. We can ask him if he's ready. What do you think about that, Robin, commissioners? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. idea. Let's get it going. I think it's fine to to keep going. I wonder how we have advertised this for public participation. We we have we advertised in terms of the uh, a block of time. It was from. Then one, I think we're good. From one thirty to four fifteen. So we're, I think we're good. Although my uh, my sheet says September all the way through. Yeah, we we changed that. <laughs> oh, okay. You should have a, you should have a revised. Okay, I figured it out. So if the assessor's ready, uh, then we can have uh, the auditor let her know, let Mary know perhaps that we're uh, running a bit ahead of schedule. Good afternoon, Steven. What was that, Romero? Um, I'm greeting Steven. Oh, okay. Hello, Steven, welcome, assessor. You're, you're muted, Steven. Hello. Good afternoon. Go. We're running. We're running a little bit ahead of schedule. If you're ready, if you don't mind to begin your presentation, will that be okay? Um, I had emailed Robin for a little help. Am I? Are you ready for me then? Yeah. Pulling it up right now. Oh, okay. wonderful. <clears throat> Let's start. And then I have to do this. And then I'll share my screen. Now I'll introduce the assessor, Stephen Drew, to the people watching on Zoom or YouTube. And that will be tab number three on your packet. So are you ready for me to fire off here? Yes, sir. Oh, good afternoon, commissioners, Robin Romero staff. Um, and the public, I appreciate this opportunity to present my uh, budget request. Uh, so just a little bit of overview to begin with. Um, the Office of the Assessor has a responsibility to appraise all property on a fair and equitable basis to maintain accurate and easily accessible property information to administer the senior and disabled and current use exemption programs to process all appeals in a timely manner and to provide exceptional customer service. And we do everything in our power to achieve all of those goals and do a pretty good job of it given the resources that we have. Um, I think if I'm looking at this correctly, Robin, the next screen gives my uh, a view of the funds, right? So, so pretty simple office from a fund standpoint uh, commissioners, we are entirely general fund funded with one exception. And that exception involves a small fund that uh, is a portion of uh, the REIT dollars collected on every REIT transaction. It goes into uh, several funds, the REIT money does, but this specific fund is, um, I think, kind of commonly known as the REIT technology fund. And it's been used for a variety of purposes over the years, but currently statute dictates that it can be used for two things only. The first you probably heard from the treasurer is for maintenance of the paperless REIT system. And uh, I think he has a legal opinion that expands that a little bit to maybe include a printer, maybe include part of an FTE. 
Um, I'm a little sketchy on that, but but that's one of the purposes. The other purpose is for um, administering administration of a property assessment system and the legal opinion on that, because the legislature in its wisdom was not brutally clear, is that that is, uh, encompasses labor, so employees, computers, software, and mailing. So really the, the core elements of what we do in the office. There is um, not enough inflow into this account to fully fund an FTE. So uh, you'll see when we get a bit farther in my presentation, our objective is to fund part of an FTE with Reed and part with general fund. So the amount that's reflected here, the 49,000, is the amount of REIT dollars that we would require if the budget to request that I'll get to later was approved. If not, this uh, 49,000 would need to be increased to cover the full cost of the FTE. And this is an FTE that is out for um, applications currently as it became vacant. It is the uh, an appraiser assistant position. Um, so maybe next, next slide, please. So, I think I don't exactly follow the, the instructions and Robin's very patient and her staff are very patient, but I'm pretty um, intentional here to, and I'll read this into the record for the public, uh, but I, my, my objective is that commissioners, y'all are scribbling a whole bunch of notes. You don't really need to scribble too many notes here. You might star and underline. So this is, this is my detail of challenges and you've heard some of this before. Understaffing of the assessor's office continues to be our greatest challenge. 12 years ago, 2008, our office faced deep cuts. I was not in office then, um, wasn't a happy time. Today, we have 32 FTE. This is six fewer employees than in 2008 to perform our duties even as Thurston County continues to grow. Over this period, our population has grown by more than 50,000 real property parcels have grown by 7,861. That's important because we must inspect every parcel at least once every six years. Personal property accounts have increased from 5,826 to 7,266. That reflects a robust small business um, expansion in our county. The senior exemption accounts have grown from 5,170 and is on a pace to exceed 6,000 by year end. Uh, more importantly, uh, we expect 300 more senior applications in 2020 than we processed in 2019. A third of those exemptions with COVID overlaid on the process take roughly 45 minutes to process. So it's a huge increase in burden in that side of the office. Um, over the same period, our county's total assessed value has increased from 32.2 billion to 45.9 billion and the legislature has substantially increased our administrative duties. Next slide. Um, so to address this growing problem, I have reorganized the office on three occasions, reduced uh, management positions office-wide by one half and have cross-trained my entire staff in order to meet dozens of mandatory deadlines each year. Over the years, we have implemented every imaginable efficiency, assembled and invested in highly functioning team. We involved two employees in the lean process and they were lean certified and we completed a project that brought efficiency to our office and other offices. In addition, while I have heard of efficiencies related to COVID-19 in other sectors of county government, this has not been our experience. Over, uh, even without this additional challenge, our ability to accommodate inevitable growth in all areas cited above will require the addition of staff on both our property administration and appraisal teams. So um, the next slide uh, details policy level proposals, but before I dive into that, what I would say 
uh, you all are pretty aware of, and I, I want to acknowledge uh, that um, our initial um, priority was to obtain the um, enhanced pictometry imagery for the county. It would both um, aid us in um, not spending more time in the field than was normal before the pandemic, um, and uh, be safer for our employees, be safer for the public. Um, and uh, that um, budget request for the first two years, as I understand it, is being funded with uh, federal grant money, which um, however it's funded, I'm happy to finally have the tool. And uh, for the taxpayers of Thurston County, I'm happy to see federal dollars applied to that expense for the first two years. So that um, asset uh, enables us, I believe, to get through the next budgetary year without need for more staff on the appraisal side. Um, this budget request, this, this first priority one request is for the other side of my office. This is the side of the office that processes the senior exemptions and uh, property transactions. So in response to the passage of engrossed substitute Senate Bill 5160 and the ongoing COVID pandemic, the assessor's office is requesting an additional one and a half FTE. One FTE would be a property control analyst, which is the classification of the folks who are cross-trained to process senior exemptions in the office as, a, as well as a number of other tasks. Um, and uh, the other is um, a half of an FTE um, uh, at a slightly lower classification, but those two requests um, are intended to address the increased workflow as consequence of 5160 and COVID. So when that bill went into effect, uh, it made significant changes to the senior exemption disabled persons and, and uh, um, uh, military disabled persons exemption program um, and created substantial increases in workload for our department. This request corresponds with Thurston County's strategic initiative, effective uh, uh, county organization priority two. So I'm assuming, uh, just to finish on that prior one, and you're okay, Robin, by, by progressing, but uh, I'm assuming that you have the memo uh, that was presented uh, by uh, Dan Janega of my office, which details in greater minutia <laughs> the um, challenges in his side of the office and how these uh, FTE requests would address those. I would point out that um, uh, the uh, impact of COVID on our office operations is, is greatest with respect to how we interact with our senior population. They're all of them a high risk population. So as, with all of the effort that went in and, and there was great partnership from central services and from all of you to modify our office and make it safer, our seniors still are, do not wanna come into the office to conduct business. The consequence is that many of the applications for the senior exemption program take a lot more time to process. It's due to technological, um, uh, poor technological skills, not much worse than my own. So I'm not being critical <laughs> uh, anyway, um, but it's due to that challenge of working remotely with uh, folks that are less technologically. <laughs> and so we spend a great, more, a great deal more time now than before the pandemic in processing these um, important exemptions. So my second um, request is gonna look a little similar to uh, two years ago, um, gentlemen. Um, we had requested uh, $20,000 uh, back in, in the last biennium and we received $10,000 a year um, and the, the the basis for the request is the same, 
although the circumstances have changed. So um, the REIT fund, the inflow into the REIT fund is not um, equal to or in excess of the cost of a single FTE, the appraiser assistant FTE. So in the long run, funding this FTE completely with REIT dollars is not sustainable. And um, I've had meetings with Jeff and we both have an interest in having this fund be sustainable in being sure that for the, for the expenses that we seek to fund with this fund that we're able to assure you through the budgetary cycle that we're uh, approving that the money will be there if needed to fund the things that we ask you to, to um, appropriate money for. And so um, while there's, there's adequate money to fund this FTE this year in the REIT fund, if we don't begin sharing the expense between general fund and REIT, then we'll find ourselves in need of funding the FTE completely with general fund in a future year. So, um, you know, we, I did some things externally to try to solve this problem. When, when the legislature passed the uh, graduated REIT bill, statewide change in REIT allocation, it benefited larger counties and penalized smaller counties. And we were on the cusp of the counties that receive less revenue uh, overall and less revenue into this fund because of that graduated REIT bill. So in the last session, I worked um, extensively with the head of finance in, in the House and Senate to um, uh, pass a bill that would increase the percentage or the amount of REIT money that would come to our county in total and come to the county specifically for this fund. And we were successful. That bill passed both the House and Senate with unanimous votes. I, there might've been one or two in the house, I think. I think one no vote. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, this was one of the bills that was at the governor's desk for signature that raised a fear tax at the onset of a crisis and he vetoed the bill. And so where we are today is where we were a year ago. Um, the, the inflow into the REIT fund is less than it was at the beginning of the last biennium. And the need for this supplement is greater therefore than it was even at the beginning of the last biennium. So the request is to have 30% of the FTE funded in our budget as in general fund dollars. And uh, with that, it amounts to 20,146.43. I believe that's a good number. We got that from budget staff or, or HR staff. Um, and the remaining F portion of the FTE would be uh, able to be funded from REIT dollars. And those are my budget enhancement requests. Um, I, I will say, if I have a minute or two, um, that um, this budgetary process feels differently to me than the last one that we went through a couple of years ago and the one before that. And, uh, and we're certainly, this is a different year, so, so I'm not grumpy about that. I just want to point out that my policy level requests are based on the assumption that my budget is not otherwise going to be cut. And if um, it comes to pass that our budgets are otherwise going to be cut in any fashion, then it would change my priorities rather dramatically. So for instance, if you were to um, impose furloughs as opposed to on, on my workforce, uh, we talked about this before in the in the summer, but the consequence would be for every day that we have a required furlough, multiplied the number of field appraisers. Those would be appraisal days I couldn't get back. And we cannot get the work done that we have to get done every year. It's a linear process with dozens and dozens of, of Department of Revenue deadlines. And so if, if we're going to have furloughs, 
we're going to have to have more budget for overtime for my folks who are working for 10 days to work the fifth day. And they'll do that with proper compensation, but I have to be able to finish this linear process. I'm required by law to finish it on a rigid calendar. And so if, if that is, um, becomes a reality here in the coming weeks, then I will need time to consider the best path forward, um, the best request to express that both respects the budget situation and allows us to salvage the deadlines that we must meet. And with that, I'll pause for questions. Thank you uh, very much. I've got uh, three or four, but I'll start with uh, I'll start with Commissioner Mensa this time. Okay. Um, I'll kind of work backwards. The the last piece about the the REIT uh, funds and the par partially funding the uh, position there, appraisal assistant. It says that on the it's a lot of paper, and I'm not sure if I can use the terms and make it clear to you what paper I'm referring to. But on one paper. It talks about that as a $20,000 expenditure change. But on the slide that we were just discussing, it looked like it was already funded at 10,000 and we wanted, you want to bump that to 20. So is that a $10,000 policy so, increase or 10 or 20? So, uh, and it's, uh, there's $170 in there somewhere, but, but rounding yeah. to, rounding out yeah, yeah. to 10,000. So um, for 2019 and 2020, there's $10,000 that, that was approved in the biennium per year. And that was applied to this FTE. So the, the numbers that you see uh, depend on how you address the budget this year. For instance, um, $10,000 a year was approved for the prior biennium. Does that go away? If it does, then for this one year, we're, we need the 20,000, 140, whatever it is. If the $10,000 that was in the 19 and 20 budgets is a continuing amount of money, then we only need the additional $10,000. And so that's what we assumed. And so we believe the net budget implication of this request is roughly $10,000. But I, I honestly don't know, and perhaps Robin can answer what happens with the ten thousand dollars from the prior biennium, um, and that's why the numbers are confusing, Commissioner. Right. So I am assuming that the ten thousand dollar carried forward in the base. It was not a one-time um, approval for the ten thousand dollars to pay, but I'm gonna defer to my team who can see in the system. Denise, I see a hand. It will take me a minute, but I'll look it up. Okay. 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 I'll go. So I'll we'll go to clarify the next. that. Thank you. Um, in your, um, there seemed to be a, and again, I, I understand, well, in the, and Robin, can you tell me how to refer to the, back when we were talking to the treasurer and I was talking about those two graphs, what's the name, what's the name of this report so that Steve will know what I'm talking about? These are the budget pages okay, uh, the bu from the budget book. The pages. Okay, in the budget, budget pages, yeah. in the budget pages, uh, it says the highest priority request for your office is the, is this re position we were talking about. The second priority request was the property control analyst. And it seemed like in your slides, you had those flipped. And I wasn't sure if that was a typo or you just wanted to clarify for us what your priority list would be on these. Uh, so if that's correct, and I expect it is, you're looking at both things. Uh, the, uh, the one which had the REIT funding uh, as the top priority think is incorrect. I'm trying to look back through this other slide. Okay. 
Uh, so the the REIT funding is a lower priority than the uh, FTE or one and a half FTE in the property administrative side. Okay, great. And, and, then, and I, I will I will yeah. say that I will say that it's a it's a lower priority um, for one reason only, and that is if if you can't fund it in this budget year, we can change the appropriation from the REIT fund and push this problem out until the next biennium budget. So. Okay. Denise. Go ahead, Denise. Yeah. Um, so the $10,000 didn't carry forward because of the way we had it structured. And so what we did, uh, cause I helped Nicole on this one. Um, yeah. So what we did is in the system this time we allocated 30% of the position to uh, the general fund, 70% to REIT technology. And the way we have it structured, it would roll forward uh, in the future. But it was plugged in as a, it, it was just kind of the quirk of the way it was done. I will say it was a, a huge challenge um, having my executive assistant change in the middle of this process. And Robin and Dottie and, and your staff were were hugely helpful uh, with my great new employee, but but so unfair to her, you know, to <laughs> have to understand all of these nuances. And so uh, we did the very best we could. And I, I, I accept that answer uh, um, that the 10,000 goes away. So it both is true commissioners that what I'm asking for is 10,114 more than in the earlier biennium and that in this biennium, uh, I need the 20,142 because the 10,000 went away. For this year, for this coming year, yeah. Yes, Not thank that. you. Okay, my next question is um, on the paragraph in the budget pages that talk about the seniors program, toward the bottom of that paragraph, it says, we continue to invest considerable time related to the creation and administration of gopher soils assessment impact policy. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about that and, uh, and whether our HCP being approved would, would affect that in any way, helpfully or, or not helpfully. Well, um, I'm wondering where, if that's an artifact from the prior year, um, However, um, it is a fact that uh, as the land use policy evolves, that um, we must then look at that land use policy from upstairs and um, modify practices and adjustments that occur in the valuing of property as appropriate. And so um, the distinction in, in what's appropriate is uh, there's a considerable amount of, of record on at the State Board of Tax Appeals and the BOE, but principally the State Board of Tax Appeals in that um, in looking at adjusting value for prairie soils, uh, also known as gopher habitat, um, that the existence of pocket gophers must be documented. And when it's documented, then the influence on value is something that we can consider. Um, the Department of Revenue issued an advisory on that subject, uh, on, the, on the subject of documentation being required in connection with uh, water policy, the Hearst uh, um, litigation that drove water policy in our state. And there, there was a similar lack of clarity as to when do you make the adjustment for the inability to get water or for a lengthy process to get water rights. And Department of Revenue directed that you could only make an adjustment when you have actual documentation that water rights are not provided. That sounds like it's off topic, Commissioner, but we have over the years, since the beginning of the um, determination of threatened, um, we have had to apply a lot of effort every year to monitoring the sequence of events in, in the setting of land use policy 
around the Endangered Species Act and uh, striving to make sure that we equitably um, and justly um, consider that influence in the setting of value. So it's a very time consuming thing because it's been a moving target, right? right. right. And continues to be actually. Thank you. I, I just had one, one other question then I'll see. Um, on the next page of that, of that um, budget sheets, it says uh, each year number of parcels you inspect increases an additional 20 855 parcels were added in just the past two years and heightened new construction activity prevents further challenges due to understaffing. And I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the increase in the heightened construction activity. This morning, uh, we were told that, um, you know, regulatory roadblocks are killing new construction in Thurston County. And I, I've been under the assessment that new construction was kind of on a boom and the pages that you're that you're I did what you've said in here seems to corroborate that. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about where we're at with with new construction because it affects your office directly. So um, I don't want to pick a fight with anything anyone thing that was said earlier, but but I but I think that both statements can be true simultaneously. So um, my feeling is that that um, when regulations are excessive or unclear or um, administered in a more burdensome way that it does have a, a, a negative effect, can have a negative effect on new development. But Thurston County is um, a, a concentric ring county. I don't know if you've heard that phrase, but from when you look at the urban uh, nucleus for our state, you know, Seattle and then, uh, you know, King, King and then Pierce and Snohomish, uh, um, the, the counties outside of just outside of that area are seeing a great deal of pressure, enough pressure that it overcomes um, anything that's occurred here. I can speak for this county from a regulatory standpoint, because um, there isn't available land, uh, available cost effective land to our north. So that drives people to commute from the north or from the south and from the north to the urban area. And um, so we have that influence and we have joint base Lewis McCord and we have a pretty stable um, employer in state government. Um, and, and you can see where this development is occurring. It's, it's, it's in the Hawks Prairie area and uh, outside of Lacey and in Lacey. And it, it, it emphasizes that point that the pressure is from the north and uh, we're seeing a great deal of growth. We saw so much growth in the Hawks Prairie area that we had to modify our um, inspection plan with Department of Revenue. So we file a five-year plan that says, these are the areas we're gonna inspect each year. We had so much growth, there was no way that we could get it done because Hawks Prairie was all in one region. So we had to divide it into three different regions. So um, again, I think both statements can be true, uh, but the one thing that we can't change here in Thurston County is the pressure for um, folks to live here and commute north. Uh, that's going to continue to to be a factor. It's why that we're growing so rapidly. Thanks. That's all I had for you. Mr. Edwards. Yes, sir. Uh, Steve, how much did we cut your, with the 2% cut, how much of a cut did you get? How many dollars? Just roughly. Well, it was two percent of uh, four million. So I'm, I guess, roughly that's what it was. If you had that two percent reinstated to your budget, uh, is there a good chance we'd get a portion of that back in a year-end fund balance, or would it all go away? Well, um, uh, it 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 would go away because. The 2% um, reduction in my office uh, was achieved by pushing out the 
replacement of software. And by holding on to our fleet of vehicles for an additional year, that is, we um, solve that with uh, uh, ER&R rate um, to stop collecting that uh, for this year and uh, to stop collecting for the uh, IT replacement fund for this year. I would say that, that historically, um, if you looked at a, a graph, uh, with all respect, meaningless as it would be, but if you looked at a, at a graph of each office or department and how much budget they turn in, in at the end of the year, it is, it is more likely that what you see for those that turn in very little, that those are underfunded offices. And the ones that turn in a lot are likely to be more adequately funded. So, so my, um, in order to survive um, for my entire time in office, um, we don't um, replace anything in the beginning of the year in the first quarter. Um, we don't buy the, the um, periodicals that we need in order to um, uh, build our commercial model until the fourth quarter. Uh, when we get to um, halfway through the year and we see what trend we're on, for several years I had an, a, a great employee still with us who was very ill and um, did not uh, seek shared leave. And so we had vacancy savings. And as we um, got the vacancy savings, we applied that savings to extra help and to the other tools that we needed but didn't have the money in the budget for. And so every year, Commissioner, in the fourth quarter, we look at our unmet needs and we look at how much money there is to work with and we do the best we can to, to serve the taxpayers with the money that has been budgeted to us. Consequently, um, I would guess that, that my office returns a lower percentage of its budget as unspent than most offices. And the, and the last comment I'd make is that there's another reason for that. I mean, half of my budget is inner fund and roughly half of my budget is salary and benefit. And only um, something like less than 200,000 of my budget is other than that. That is, that is discretionary on what we spend it on. And from that, most of of that money is spent on mandatory mailings, which are funded from within my budget, unlike the auditor and other offices that have mandatory mailings. Okay, then uh, maybe just a follow up to that, would it be safe to say that we could do a better job for our constituents if we uh, funded that back to you this year, that 2%? I mean, you're probably, what it sounds like to me, you've postponed a lot of inevitable things that are going to happen, whether it's buying tires or computers or whatever. So uh, it would uh, be a benefit to the citizens of Thurston County and make you more efficient if we were to give you that back. Well, absolutely. Um, we were we were um, uh, salting away money for the IT replacement because it has a limited life, and and at at a at some point in time. Uh, each year becomes more valuable to get the latest technology. So we operate with downloads um, and the counties that have the latest software are cloud-based and working uh, Wi-Fi um, and it's more efficient. Uh, but um, given the choice to see cuts in staff, since, since we can't shoulder more or less get the work done with less staff um we chose to put off the software replacement so so in doing that and and choosing to put off the vehicle replacement by a year um that was not an indication that we don't need the software and we don't eventually need to replace the vehicles uh so i wouldn't want that to be a permanent choice uh, but when compared to cutting staff, it was a better choice. Thank you. Uh, so far, both commissioners have asked a couple of my questions, which is good. Go ahead, Ty, and you'll hit another one. Just a follow up to Commissioner Edwards. So uh, in comparison to cutting staff, it was a better choice, but 
when it's a comparison, if, if it were a comparison to your newer policy request? I mean, if um, is that a good choice, I guess? And, or another way to say the same question is, if refunding each department the 2% cut, if that used up the available additional money that was there to be allocated toward policy level requests, is that a preferable approach to you than, than you know, not looking at those cuts and, and looking at your new requests? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, so in making the decision to fund the 2% with, uh, let me talk about ERNR, the vehicle replacement fund, um, that involved the the manager for ERNR. Um, and, and there was a, a value decision made um, that uh, risking increased cost of maintenance um, was a manageable risk. And that um, because we have uh, significantly more money in the vehicle replacement fund than it will cost to replace the next two vehicles, that delaying the inflow of funds could be corrected in out years. And if we had a vehicle fail that needed to be replaced, we would not suffer a reduced fleet. We would increase the risk by one increment that if we had two more vehicles go down, that we then wouldn't have the money to replace the third vehicle, right? And so to answer that question, we would need to have another discussion with the ERNR manager. Um, my feeling is that um, we could um, continue to not pay into that fund for another year without uh, an unmanageable risk um, in so far as my fleet goes, because my fleet is relatively new. It is a fact that when I was first elected, I, I delayed the replacement of my vehicles. Um, and, uh, and I, at that time, the county was, was turning over its vehicles based on a mileage maximum or an, an annual, a, a, an age maximum. And so I was acquiring surplus vehicles from other departments and using them for three years and then auctioning them off for roughly the same price that I paid for them. Um, and I, I was able to do that because we don't put very many miles on the vehicles. We, we go to a neighborhood and then we go forward 100 feet and forward 100 feet all day, right? And so it's a little bit different than public works that is uh, heading out to a project and back or a building inspector that's all year long going one shot outings. And so um, we did that for several years, but the um, in the wisdom of ER and our manager, and I'm not being facetious, as they analyzed the maintenance cost, the maintenance cost on those vehicles was higher, even though we weren't um, uh, in need of more replacement reserve money because we weren't replacing with new vehicles. Ultimately, I have assimilated. Ultimately, I am uh, have agreed to the deduction or the um, deposit into the replacement fund and agreed to uh, replace my vehicles based on age, regardless of miles and uh, uh, with new vehicles. And um, both systems worked well. Uh, I'm again, I have assimilated with the program. I hope that answers your question. Is that it? Okay. Uh, Stephen, uh, you said on uh, your challenges that uh, you have six fewer employees than you had 12 years ago in 2008. But the work's getting done. I mean, it's admirable. Has technology helped considerably in getting the work done with fewer employees? And I guess the follow-up is, is technology taking jobs? Uh, Commissioner, when I was first elected, the work wasn't getting done. There was a three-year backlog in appeals. Uh, none of our deadlines were being met. The uh, reval notices were sent out either three or four months late and had been sent out late for more than a decade. Um, the relationship with the public in terms of customer service was uh, challenge to receive a D grade. The um, uh, relationship, frankly, was was one of, of uh, near hostility. 
as a consequence, the morale in my office was very low. And um, um, so the, the initial reorganization that I did in the first months of holding office um, reduced management by half. I used that bandwidth without increasing budget to make, um, I can't recall exactly, I think there were five or six positions that were either half time or three quarter time. We increased all of those to full time positions with the savings of reducing management. And we added back uh, an, uh, um, an FTE, I think one, but maybe two FTEs so that we had enough appraisers again. In the first six months with the, the new organization, we eliminated the backlog and appeals and we've stayed current my entire tenure. Uh, we, um, in that um, either the first year or the second year, so either 2011 or 2012, uh, we got the reval notices out on time, and we've sent them out on time every year since, except this year, intentionally, they were delayed um, because of COVID. And so um, I don't honestly think it's due to technology. It's due to, to cross-training. It's due to reducing the management-to-worker ratio from a, a ridiculous 1 to 5 to 1 to 10, um, and that's allowed more workers to um, exist in the same budgetary cost. Uh, so that's how we're getting things done. Uh, and my, so my point in my narrative is that we've run out the elastic, right, in, in, in terms of finding the, the finding efficiencies. You know, why don't you solve it by finding efficiencies? I both believe the county could find a lot of efficiencies and find savings in using methods similar to what we've done in my office, cross-training everyone, uh, getting people out of the somewhat inevitable bureaucratic mindset of this is my job description and this is the stuff that's on my plate or on my table. And when I'm done, I'm done. So if I'm ahead, I'll work a little slower and that's nice. And I will say that that's also healthy my staff doesn't have that luxury. They're running the whole time because they're all committed as one big team to moving to, from project to project inside and outside the, the, the clearest intent of their job description so that we can meet deadlines as they occur throughout the office. So if we had an endless supply of technology, um, it, the, the pictometry is going to help uh, delay the need for another FTE, I think. You know, I, I feel that way, but time will tell. If, if we had every technological advantage, sure, um, that would probably cause an FTE savings. But what I can say is that the pictometry piece alone delays the need for more FTEs in order to continue to get the work done. So what it offsets is, is the growth in parcels that we have to inspect, the growth in seniors that, that we're working with, uh, the growth in every process in our office. We're able to offset that growth with a little bit more efficiency uh, using that technology. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it was just, it was just uh, eye-catching that we've grown more uh, by more than 50,000 people and you're dealing with the same workload or a workload uh, with fewer employees than 12 years ago. Let me ask you this, um, and this is for public consumption because we have audience watching as well. You said early on, Stephen, that the uh, the legislature increased your administrative duties. What are those? What, what was increased? Well, it's occurred a, a number of times, um, but most recently, the, 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 the best example of that is the senior exemption program. Now, look, I was, was and continue to be the legislative chair, and, and I lobbied for the in, improvements in the senior exemption program. They were much needed. Um, the cost, the household cost of living had increased substantially in our county, and the thresholds for the senior exemption program had not kept pace with that increase. And as a consequence, seniors were suffering in our county to a much greater degree without a relief program than they are today. But an inevitable component of that 
is the wave of new applications that we've seen um, because the thresholds were increased and it, it, it allowed a, a whole bunch more people to qualify and even more than that, to be interested in qualifying and going through the application process and perhaps not qualifying. That's true for the, for the uh, disabled military exemption that uh, the commission, uh, uh, legislators wrote the law to, to provide for that. Um, and uh, they said that if you were 100% disabled, you could qualify. And what was learned is that as a practical matter, the intention for someone who is nearly completely disabled, unable to earn a living in virtually every case, um, the intention was that they have an exemption. The reality was they didn't have an exemption and assessors are the ones that saw that. And so we sought to decrease the percentage of disability to cause the legislator's <coughs> intent to, to actually occur. And so that was reduced from 100% to 80%. The end result is that, that more um, seriously disabled former military uh, have applied and, and more have qualified. And, but they're, they're just, it's, it's hard to list, Commissioner. There are so many laws that touch property tax. Um, when, they, when they passed the McCleary um, solution and they created a rate instead of what all of the rest of property tax is based on an approved budget divided into the value, well, the rate is multiplied by the value. And so uh, later this week, I'll be um, participating in a legislative um, uh, interim committee and expressing the vagaries of that folly because really it was a bad decision. Um, but that one thing alone drove work in our office because everything else is calculated in one way, this is calculated in another way. There was a very significant public outreach need to communicate and educate about that change. And there was a lot of um, angst expressed to the assessor and treasurer based on the, the up and down of property tax and that up and down was caused by the fact that passing that rate generated more money than was intended. So the legislature um, passed a one year reduction in that rate. So everybody's property tax went down two years ago for 2019. And in 2020, that reduction expired and the tax went up. So the workload associated with things beyond our control is very real and it and it it's true for all of the individually electeds and true for each of you but uh the in the property tax area it's um there's no way to manage it from our standpoint legislatively because there are, are a, a lot of factors that that drive workload um, well i'm you were the legislative chair and i thank you for uh, lobbying for the senior citizens and uh disabled veterans uh, no, yeah. even though it, it uh, increased your workload uh, or your work effort, no good deed goes unpunished. But that's a very good deed you did, and thank, thank you for the leadership as the assessor in streamlining and getting out of that backlog years ago. Thank you thank very you. much. Any other questions, uh, commissioners? No, sir. Okay. Anything else, Stephen? To wrap it up, anything further? Briefly. Um, I just say thank you for your time, and and I, I want to again acknowledge. Uh, uh, your staff um, and Robin's whole team, um, because uh, we've needed some extra hand holding. We always need some. We do because we get good at this, and then it's two years or a year, and we need to get good at it again. So um, I very much appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you for saying that because they are awesome. Yeah, they are. Thank, you. thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Uh, thank you, Assessor. And we'll see you, see you soon. All right. Take care. Bye -bye. Is Mary available? Uh, no. No. I, I don't know if we can call her, but maybe you can give us a 10 minutes. To see if yeah, you want, let's take a 10 minute break. Take, take a short break, and I'll be around to pick these up. Um, high, medium, low on the two items that the assessor presented to you. Okay. 
Okay. We're in recess.
And we're continuing on, and we have uh, Auditor Mary Hall with us to discuss the uh, her office's budget. So uh, go ahead, and Robin, you want to start? No, nope, I'm just okay. going to hand it right over to Mary. Thank you, Mary. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Is this Much better? better? Much better. Okay, I closed a bunch of applications. That probably helped. Perfect. All right. So I, I like to call the auditor's office the Swiss Army Knife of county government because we do a lot of different things. We're really not just one duty. Um, we have a lot of duties that really don't relate to each other. So, um, you know, we've always been a leader in the state. Um, we provide licensing services. We record all of the um, land records. Uh, we issued passports until COVID, which we plan to take up uh, as soon as this is over. Of course, we provide financial services for the county as well as grants management and internal audit. And then of course, elections. And I'm really proud to say that this year, um, and I wanna say we, because it's not just I, the Washington State Association of County Auditors um, awarded me the President's Award, which that not only goes to me, but it's basically how every division in my office is a great partner to counties across the straight, uh, state to mentor them. Um, so I, I can't tell you enough how honored I am to lead such an amazing staff. I also won the Heavy Hitter Award for legislation, and this was because uh, we've been working for several decades to get the state to pay their share of election costs, and we finally got that passed last year, uh, which is a huge win for counties. And we also won a national award for the cybersecurity uh, task force that we stood up, Robin, which I know you're a part of, and that was recognized nationally for a great effort um, with the cybersecurity threats that we currently have in front of us. And just to give you a little overview of 2020, of course, we are in, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And the one of the things that I've always been big on is continuity of operation plans. So we we're fortunate to have done a lot of tabletop exercises before this pandemic hit. Um, so I think my staff were will, really well trained to respond to this. We were able to keep 100% of our staff productively working and we quickly converted to 100% telework uh, capabilities by using training computers and things like that. And I'm also proud to say that 100% of my staff are using multi-factor authentication for security. So it's something you know and something you have. So while they're working remotely, we can be assured that um, they're very secure doing so. And I was also able to pivot some of my recording and li licensing staff to special projects, um, which has kept everybody working at 100% capacity. Some of the other challenges, we certified the primary election and had to pivot during this pandemic. And it happened right in the middle, which was really a challenge, but we successfully conducted that election, had everybody quickly start using masks and uh, gloves. We successfully conducted our primary election with drive-through voter services because there was no way we could carry out that election in building one using room 152, which we have in the past. We also worked with our title companies and got them to use 100% of electronic recording. So we didn't have to service these um, recording customers in person. It was all done electronically. Our sub-agents all stayed open, and, which was great for us when the county was closed because we were able to redirect customers to our sub-agents and there are eight located across the country or county. Um, we finished our Secretary of State audit, um, which went really well. And I'm really proud to say that it was finished on time. And for the fifth year in a row, Thurston County has a clean audit 
And I want to say a huge shout out to my financial staff, but also all the financial staff across the county, because they do accountability audits, they audit multiple departments. And from 2012 to 2014, we received five audit findings, which put us in a high risk category. So this is substantially um, lowered our audit costs with the state auditor's office because we are now in a low risk category. And my financial services folks are such a great help to all the departments um, across the county. And we're working really hard to make sure that we have great documentation for use of all of these federal funds that we've received. And we were pretty pre prepared for these because we actually brought the folks who were involved in the OSO landslide to Thurston County twice to talk to our financial folks about the importance of, importance of documenting in an event such as this. So I feel like the county is in really good hands to recognize um, uh, full recuperation of these, these funds that we have in front of us. Elections, it's been a challenging year for elections. We've dealt with things we've never had to deal with before in a year that is always a challenge being a presidential election year. We anticipate by the time we get to November, we're going to be at 200,000 registered voters and we expect about 90% turnout. So that means we are going to be processing approximately 100,000, 180,000 ballots in our ballot processing center. You know, the challenges we've had is how do we maintain transparency in this process because we're limiting observers to two at a time because we have to keep staff safe and our facility isn't big enough to have the groups through like we've had in the past. So we are going to live stream our entire ballot processing um, throughout the election. The other challenges that this has brought us is we uh, are working with half the staff at the ballot processing center because we have to do that physical distancing. And in our primary election, we had the highest turnout since we've had since the 1960s, which is pretty phenomenal. This year we had um, the Secretary of State's office did uh, election review, which really is going over all of our procedures and they also did a security review. Um, in addition to that, we had the Department of Homeland Security in last year as well as this year to do cyber security reviews. They did penetration testing and they also did a physical review of our ballot processing center and we implemented a lot of their recommendations. Because of this pandemic, we really had to um, pivot to see how we were going to conduct this election so we reached out, um, actually the assessor suggested that we reach out to South Puget Sound Community College. So they were gracious enough to allow us to use their Montman campus. So we're offering strictly drive-through voter services for this presidential election. You know, it's really critical that we keep our election staff, election staff of which I only have eight full-time staff um, and voters safe but still be able to vote during this presidential election. So we're working with the college. It's actually a great setup. And we've also partnered with inner city transit for dial a lift transportation for our disability community. Recording has really had a record breaking year despite this economic turndown. Um, our title companies have made a significant shift to using e-recording, which is great because it saves a lot of staff time. And it also eliminates uh, a lot of customers coming into our lobby. And our September year-to-date revenue was $680,000. And we only budget revenue of, of $701,000. So we're actually at year end of September at 90%, 97% of our projected revenue. So we estimate that we're gonna come in 22% above or $165,000. And in addition to that, I'm proud to say, we've been trying to, um, you know, be as frugal as we possibly can because we know we're gonna be facing some tough economic times. So our protect, projected expenditures are actually 7% below what we budgeted. 
Now, licensing has been a little more interesting. Uh, our workload really fluctuates um, really dramatically. Uh, Department of Licensing has been challenged. There are a couple months that they did not get their renewal notices out, which certainly affected us. And they're very far behind. So they reached out and asked us to assist with um, issuing their disability placards. And, you know, being the team player that we are, we agreed to that. Um, and there is also a legislative change that went into effect this year. This alleg legislation was, I passed the not last year, but the year before, which was the first time we've seen a, a fee increase in 20 years. And I'm proud to say I worked really hard on this legislation. And what that's going to recognize for the county is an approximately $600,000 additional annual revenue. Year-to-date revenue, we're at about 1.7 million at the end of September, which is about 82% of our annual budget. And again, our expenditures are down about 6% because we've been able to reallocate some of our resources, meaning people, um, to our historical scanning project. We did have to suspend passports with this COVID um, pandemic, which was a real shame because there's a big backload right now. But we did suspend passports in March because it would bring families into the office and it was just too much for us to deal with in that tiny lobby that we have. But the federal government also pushed back the real ID enforcement deadline back to 2021. So we have every um, intent to resume passport services as soon as we can. And all of our staff have completed their recertification for 2021. So as soon as we're able to bring passports back up, they will be ready to go hit the ground running. But what we really need to do is reopen parallel to all the major regional offices, because if we were simply to open now, we would get a deluge of customers that we would not be able to handle, which would put staff at risk, and I'm just not prepared to do that. Um, but. We're hoping that we can get passports open soon because there's a backlog of nearly a million passports nationwide. Wow. It's a huge number. Um, I have the most amazing financial services staff. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm very proud that we've received our fifth straight clean audit. And that's really a team effort because we work with other departments to make sure that they've got sound financial controls, they've got separation of duties, and they've really made Thurston County um, financial services a resource to the rest of the county. We received our 13th straight CAFR award, which is a comprehensive annual financial report. We're very proud of that. Um, and we're working really hard to ensure that our pandemic fiscal response maximizes all of federal fund reimbursements. So we're auditing on the go instead of going backwards, which what we learned from um, the OSO incident was, you know, they had to go back and try to recreate records two years after the fact, and it was simply overwhelming for them. So by being proactive and putting this team together in the beginning, we're confident that we're going to maximize all of our federal fund reimbursements. But we've got some challenges coming up in financial services. You know, most of these folks have been here for decades and which is why they're so awesome. So we're gonna have to do some su succession planning. We've got some employees that are coming up quickly on retirement. So we're working really hard to make sure that our new hires are rock stars. We keep positions open until filled. So if we're not comfortable with the, the quality of people that we get, we'll wait and go to the next batch until we find that potential rock star that is really going to lead financial services in the coming decades. Um, we're excited that our ERP project um, is going to start up again, even during this COVID pause. I think it really is important that we keep moving this project forward because we have some major retirements in front of us, specifically in payroll. 
um, which is a department of two, and we want to make sure that staff get paid. So I think we really want to pick this project up and move it forward. So I'm excited to hear that that is, um, that is on the board. So to look at the funds and the uh, personnel that the auditor's office has, you can see that it fluctuates a little bit. 2020 is of course higher because in a presidential election, we have to staff up in elections because we only have eight full-time staff. So it's really critical that we bring on extra people to get us through this. And we also have a recording, um, a project position in this mix as well. And to give you an idea of the funds that the auditor's office um, is responsible for, we have our, what we call our 1050, which is our historic preservation fund. And this, we received this as part of a recording fee that comes straight into this dedicated fund that can only be used for the preservation of historical documents. Now, currently we are funding two full-time staff members for the clerk's office because they also have a backload of these funds. We expect our revenue to be about $242,000. Expenditures are going to be high next year. We're looking at a new um, recording system. Um, and as you know, technology is not cheap, but we do have a dedicated fund to pay for it. Our election reserve fund, uh, this is a fund that is used for elections equipment. And this is funded by 15% uh, overhead that is uh, in legislation that we build a jurisdictions that goes into this little technology savings account. Uh, this year, we anticipate about $100,000 in revenue, and that's not as high as normal years because the state doesn't pay their share in even years, but that will change once they start paying in 2022. Um, and next year, we're asking for, um, you know, expenditure authority because our sorter which is what we put our ballots on to get the signature and barcode scanned that allows us to verify them quickly. Uh, that's about 15 years old and we need to replace that. And we're also seriously considering going out for some new tabulation equipment um, next year as well. So while it may look like a low balance with the state coming on board, I think we can bump that up and we've been able to utilize some grant funding as well to utilize some technology this year. Our election stabilization fund, 1610, what that is is like a savings account. Um, you know, when I took office, our, our general fund be in even year and odd years went like this. It was very difficult because in even years when the state didn't pay any election costs, we were a huge hit to the general fund budget. So our solution was to set up a savings account where we would fund this stabilization fund in years that weren't presidential elections. So for example, this year, we've kind of broken into that piggy bank and that is paying for a lot of the fund, uh, a lot of the expenses in this presidential election, <laughs> which are um, elevated a lot because turnout is so huge. We work a lot longer hours, more overtime is required and we process ballots for a lot longer time because we simply receive so much more due to high turnout. So I think it's worth pausing there a moment um, to ensure that the board's got a good grasp on the stabilization fund. Because basically what we've done is we estimate how much our election's gonna cost over the course of four years, divide that number by four, and in the first three years, anything that you appropriate to the auditor for elections that is not spent gets transferred into the stabilization fund. So in the fourth year, you've got money, as Mary said, to draw on to pay for the extraordinary costs of a presidential election. And that allows the board to have, and, and the auditor, to have a stable expectation that the money is going to be there and the budget's not going just up, down, up, down every year. So it, it was a strategy to smooth out what we know is very seasonal over a four year period. 
Exactly. Because in even years, we receive no revenue and they're very, very expensive elections, while odd numbered years, we don't see the turnout that you see in in even year elections. And we also get revenue from the cities and towns because we conduct their elections. So there's a big difference, huge difference. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate that. And we set that up, I believe, the first time uh, in 2016. Yeah, about four correctly. years ago. Yeah, and it's it's come in handy. Yep. So, uh, Ty or Gary, do you have a question about the stabilization fund? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, what I understand, if you were given the two percent back mm -hmm. that you were cut this year, that would then revert in the stabilization rather than revert back to the general fund. Is that right? Um, if you had something left of that. Yeah, if we had something left, we always budget to ensure that we can contribute to the stabilization fund. And the challenge with election budgets is we can't, we don't have a crystal ball to True. see what elections we're going to conduct in the future year because the, the, you know, resolution deadlines are 60 days before the election. So we always budget for one countywide election and then, of course, the primary in general. And, you know, it's when we have more than those that, um, you know, pose a challenge. But, you know, our 2% of budget um, was basically recognized in salary savings uh, because we were able to shift some of our licensing people into our historical um, document recording project. And then we also ended a contract with our previous voter registration vendor, which we had hoped to keep through this year, but that was about, oh, I think around $50,000, something like that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Ty. How does the legislative change from last year then, can you just spell this out for me? How does it affect this stabilization approach that we've been taking? So that's a great question. So in 2022, the state will actually begin paying their share of election costs, which this year could be 800 to a million dollars. I'm not sure. You know, it'll be interesting to see what that comes in at because this is proving to be an incredibly expensive election year. But um, they are the bulk of our ballot space, and that's how you bill out election costs. So we're going to be recognizing a tremendous amount of revenue, at least three quarters of a million dollars every um, even year election is my estimate. And of course, that will fluctuate depending whether it's a midterm election or whether it's a presidential election. Presidential elections are much more expensive. And, and for a percentage of that, because the way we're talking about stabilization, right? Yeah. So... So it's going to be easier to fund this, but there will also be a lot more going into the general fund as revenue, like there is in odd years. In odd years, we see a lot of revenue from the cities and towns and fire and school districts because they pay a proportionate share of election costs. We bill them out as allowed by state law, as required by state law, actually. And the state will also be bound by those same RCWs. So where, where the, the change in the law comes in is in revenue. We'll still want to do the stabilization on the expenditure side um, because regardless of how much revenue we collect, it costs what it costs. Exactly, yeah. We'd like that to be the same every year on our budget, so. Exactly, we, we tried to get it even so that- Steady. You know, the- the auditor doesn't have to come into the board and say, hey, you got to give me all this money now um, in a time when when the budget might be very tight. Instead, we've got this stabilization fund that helps to offset because we've been saving money as we go. Are you done? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, 2021, July 21. The state turns over the postage, uh, election return envelopes postage to the county. And it's not optional. We're getting that. Uh, so right. that, but that's it's an unfunded mandate. 
but we have we have to give you that money for that budget for that, don't we? Yes, and I, I get to that in in a little further into the presentation to talk about that. Okay. Um, but it is it is reimbursable. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll I will, be I will there. Wait. Just okay. Um, so the challenges this year have been amazing. Um, wow, I've got an amazing team. You know, we've had. Um, not just the pandemic, but some real security issues. In fact, there was a huge um, cyber attack that across the nation the last couple weeks. So um, it's cybersecurity breaches are a real and serious threat. And elections is considered critical infrastructure. And in my mind, this is huge because we have some great resources that we wouldn't have otherwise. You know, we've worked really closely with the Department of Homeland Security. They've come in and done a lot of audits um, really beginning in 2017. We worked with the state auditor's office in the last two years. They've been doing a really intense cybersecurity audit, which they do incredibly well. And the interesting thing is I think it complemented the Department of Homeland Security audit really well. Uh, this year, we also had a St Secretary of State review, not just a security view, review, but also a review of all of our policies and procedures. So that went really well. Some uh, other challenges um, as it relates to technology are financial and payroll systems. Um, you know, they don't talk to each other. They really do need to be replaced. And that's why I'm excited about the ERP starting to move forward. Our recording system is also very old and it's owned by the same company, Tyler Technologies, which uh, also was recently breached, by the way. This election with COVID has certainly um, made it readily apparent that that space is really no longer adequate for us. Even in the presidential primary, when we were doing that election, it was really tight and that was before COVID, at least up until election day, but it just is not going to work for us in another big election beginning in 2022. So we really need to find um, different space. And it's really critical in my opinion that I have all my election staff together because right now I have eight full-time election staff and they're split between two locations and it is incredibly inefficient very inefficient and we really need to be together so we can move people um, from task to task depending on where we are in the cycle. As I mentioned earlier, I've got some retirements coming up. I've got a critical one in elections coming up and then some in financial services over the next uh, one to three, four years that are some really key positions. So I wanna get into um, you know, what our policy level requests are. And Commissioner Hutchings, this addresses the uh, return postage. So the state uh, beginning in 2022 is going to pay their share of election costs, which we anticipate or estimate in 2022 to be about $670,000 for the midterm election. Um, but the law also stated that by July of 2021, the state turns over the responsibility of paying return postage to the auditors, and that's approximately $85,000. So in my opinion, I mean, we really did negotiate this with them in exchange for funding to accept the postage. Um, and I think we won in this deal. And I also think it's going to help us keep election funding in the budget and not be cut next year because they would have to then take that back. So, you know, what we were going to be dealing with in the 2021 legislative cycle is hanging on to this funding. And I feel confident that we will because we took the responsibility for the return postage. But this is really budget neutral because we bill this out as a regular election cost. So when we're conducting odd year elections for cities and school districts and fire districts, they will pay their prorated share of postage. And when you really break it down, because it's based on registered voters, it's not a huge burden 
to the jurisdictions because it's based on registered voters and nothing else. So the larger jurisdictions, like the county, we will pay more than say the city of Lacey or uh, fire district, uh, you know, number eight. So it'll all be proportional. Any questions about that? No. Not feeling like it. Okay. So our second policy request is IT security. Um, boy, it's been a year, and I think I've shared some things with some of you, but elections is a target with a big, huge target on our back, but so is county government. And cybersecurity is one of our biggest threats. You know, we had a IT person who was embedded in our office that we hired last year. Unfortunately, that person went back to the state in February. So currently the county has one full-time IT security person and we really need more depth. And, you know, we work really closely with IT and I've been working with Dennis to see what would this position look like? What would be the best fit? But I really think that this is critical and, you know, we are struggling this year because we're so limited and this isn't going to go away. These threats are not going to go away. They're only going to get worse and they're getting more sophisticated. And I really need somebody that is going to be able to be the person who monitors these threats and knows how to respond and coordinates a bigger effort if need be. So this is a really important request. And with the revenues that we've brought in, you know, both through licensing and then, of course, now coming up with um, the additional revenue for election funding, I, I hope that, you know, you can see to, to fund this position because I really believe it's critical. And, and I must say that when Rodney was here, he did phenomenal things for us. I mean, he is the one that segmented all of our systems. He is the one that did all of the research and made the recommendations of what tools to put together that we have in place now. Um, so he was invaluable while he was here, but now he's not. And I wanna bring this up now because I was going to put this in the 2021 budget and I decided to hold off. When I was first elected, we actually had 11, or I'm sorry, nine full-time election staff and uh, we were asked to cut our budget pretty heavily um, in 2014. And the only way I could do that, you know, I, I, I just couldn't see any other way was I reduced a management position in elections. But in elections in 2022, we've got redistricting in front of us. And we also have um, a lot more mandates than we have ever had due to legislation that has been passed in the last, last several years. And in 2010, when we had nine employees, we had you know, less than 150,000 registered voters. Um, now we've got about 200,000 registered voters. Plus beginning last year, we now have same day voter registration, which means I cannot redirect my voter registration staff out to the ballot processing center after the eight day cutoff which I used to be able to do before. So now I have to have all of those in voter reg plus the four I have at the ballot processing center. And if you have somebody come down with an illness, you're in a world of hurt because I just don't have the depth. Um, this year, beginning this year, we are required to set up or stand up a student engagement hub at Evergreen State College every election. And this is essentially like having another voter registration office because the people have to be able to register to vote up until 8 p.m. on election night. Plus, they need to be able to get a ballot for any precinct, regardless of they, where they live across the state. So that also requires resources. Um, and this will be our first year. Uh, you know, to be honest, I'm, I'm happy that all the students are on campus because we don't know what this is going to look like but I do know what it takes to register voters and issue a ballot for anybody, regardless if they live in Lacey or they live in Republic. 
um, it's going to be a challenge and we're going to have to figure it out. We also have our future voter program, which allows 16 and 17 year olds um, the ability to automatically register and vote. So that's a whole different dynamic of managing our voter registration database. So what I'm really hoping that we can do is use a portion, and just a portion of the new revenue that we will be receiving for the, from the state when they pay for their even year um, costs. And again, I'm not asking for this in 2021, but I certainly wanna make you aware that this is gonna be a huge need in 2022. And if I felt that I could have asked for it in 2021, I would have, but I'm trying to be financially prudent. So and if you can certainly give it to me though in 2021. If you think our budget is healthy enough, I will certainly take the position. Our historic imaging project. Now this is one of those asks that really doesn't affect the general fund at all. But it's kind of looks funky because, um, you know, we have this fund and we get all of these dedicated funds through recording fees. So it's not general fund. And we do have a project position. And what we would want to do is extend the end date. But I also want to ensure that we can still continue to allocate additional resources to this historical imaging project. And you know, the more images we have online, the less people have to come into our lobby because they're available 24 seven. And what these are, you know, we've been scanning documents. Our goal is to get back to 1950. And right now we're at 1972. And um, this pandemic has actually helped a lot because we were able to redirect some of our licensing folks when we weren't open to the public. And to give you an idea of, um, the differences in, in our back scanning productivity in quarter one of this year, we scanned 11,500 documents. Um, in quarter three of this year, we scanned 29,000 documents. So I don't, I can't guarantee because we don't know what's gonna happen with DOL or licensing. There may be a huge, you know, new buy, new car buy explosion, we don't know. But I want to have the ability and the budget authority to be able to move staff in and out of this fund to work on this project. And to do that, I have to have budget authority. So I may not use all of it, but if you could grant that to me, it doesn't affect the general fund at all, but it gives me the flexibility. And that's a key word, flexibility, to be able to knock this project out uh, sooner as opposed to later, because this is one of the funds that the state has looked at more than once to sweep and take back. Um, and if, if we don't finish this project using these dedicated funds, it's going to have to come out of the general fund eventually. And I really don't want to see that happen. So we're trying to tackle this project as, um, as quickly as we can and also make sure that we're utilizing our staff in the most productive way possible. Hey, Mary. Yes. Um, is the, the, did this fund also uh, support some of the clerk's office similar efforts? Yes, this is the same fund. We actually yeah. are funding two full-time staff positions for the clerk. Yeah. Um, so I, I, just wanna, I just wanna make sure that the, the board hears that connection um, of the two positions that is funded in the clerk's office. Yes, the clerk came to me, um, I want to say it was in 20, 2019. So we've been funding positions. We funded two positions last year. We can do it in 2021. Whether or not we can do it moving forward, um, we're going to have to see how the revenue in this fund is coming through. And um, I am really worried about this fund from a legislative standpoint because they've looked at it before. We've had to fight for it um, more than once in a legislative session. But, um, you know, I will I will fight very hard to keep this revenue because I think, you know, digitizing our historical documents is very important and it's a really good service to the public. So this, uh, you, since you're funding this for the clerk's office, we won't see that request come through for the clerk from the clerk. I believe you see that as a change order or a, a change request in my fund, Robin. How does that work? Is that 
a change request from my office or the clerk's office? So she would ask for the funding for her budget, and then we would either do a transfer of revenue or direct appropriation. And so far, we've been doing a transfer um, to fund it, but it's got to be in her budget so she right. can spend the money. And is, uh, without jumping ahead, is this in the clerk's uh, uh, budget request? Yes, you know? I'm seeing a nod. <laughs> Yeah. But I don't want to, it'd be interesting if if the, if the board wrote, uh, rated this one as low priority and then hers high or vice versa or medium, you know what I mean? Because they're, they're very connected, obviously. Yeah. So and keep in, yeah, keep in mind, this is not general fund money. This is a dedicated, highly restricted fund. Right. All right. Thank you. So the next policy request is actually for actuary costs, and this isn't something that we have an option to, to pay or not pay. Um, there have been some new governmental accounting standards, um, statement number 75 that went into effect in 2018 that requires that all public entities that offer post-employment benefits, which means retirement, um, to contract with an actuary to do the actuarial study every two years. So this is a study that we have to do every two years. Um, it requires that new accounts be reported um, in the county's financial statement and new note disclosures. And this is something that of course we contract out and this is the cost. So we will incur this cost regardless because we have to pay for it. Um, so kind of a, we don't have a way around that. It's like paying the state auditor for their audit. Uh, it's kind of in that similar category. So with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Mary, uh, Mr. Yeah. Chair, can I? Yeah, go ahead. I had to get unmuted. muted. Um, Going backwards on my sheets that we have to fill out. Um, is there anything that we should understand about the, the the cybersecurity position? It's got two entries: one, you know, hundred thousand with thirty-three thousand revenue, and then another entry of thirty-three thousand. I that looks like one connected request, but do I need to understand those two entries difference, or is or is that not? No, that's a great question. So it's. You know, because we're the Swiss Army knife of county government, um, part of that will be billed to Fund 105, which is not general fund. And then part of that will also be an election cost um, that will be billed to jurisdictions because this position will be working in multiple areas. You know, we have to secure our recorded documents. Those are critical. And um we need to make sure that that's as secure as possible, um, as well as elections. So that will not be 100% general fund. It'll be billed as an election cost for a prorated share, as well as to our fund 1050. So that's why you see it broken down like that. Yeah, right. Thank you. So what you see on your page are two lines, the impact, one line for each fund. And the revenue in the general fund is the expenditure from the maintenance and operations fund. We have to book it that way. And this is what I'm trying to get away from with direct appropriation is all these transfers. But for now, that's how this works. And it's a single request. Got the it. actual impact to the general funds roughly $63,000. So I understand then um, everything moving uh, through the first five, and then this may be a question for Robin, but there's a 20 and a 21 on our sheets. One relates to a placeholder for criminal justice sales tax, and one is a request for extension of records auditor position. And so if you're asking for us to include those in our notes, I'm going to need to know what's going on there. So the um, 
the B0309 is mm -hmm. what it would cost um, to add a criminal justice sales tax ballot measure um, to the ballot. Uh, so this is the expense that would be incurred in the auditor's office that goes along with the ballot measure that is a request from the commissioners. It's a placeholder at this point for something the commissioners are talking about. <clears throat> and line 21 <throat> is... Um, Where's 21, Ty? I don't see that. I it's see it on the next page. Um, I'm going to turn to my budget team and ask about 21. Is that the flexibility to use 1050 for, for moving staffing? I almost like chess pieces. Can I move this person into this imaging project for three days and um, having the budget authority to do that? Is that what that is? Because it looks like an FTE, but it's really not. It's the budget authority to be able to have the flexibility to move staff into this historical imaging project when they have time. Ah. So if they have time to work on it, let's say DOL forgets to send out the uh, renewal notices for January, so nobody is doing online renewals, I want to the ability to be able to utilize my staff to work on this historical imaging project. Otherwise, they're sitting around twiddling their thumbs. And believe me, we've had those times when DOL has not sent out renewal notices. So that's so Mary, not I uncommon. Think that that's your request, B0206. What we're looking at is B0502, and this is the one from the clerk's office, where they are okay. asking to tap into your... Right. Um, fund. No. Okay. So, are we going to talk? So, okay, let me go back then. On the criminal justice sales tax, it says it's on my list as a $15,000 in the revenue column, but then the note talks about the cost is $100,000. I don't understand the number. Oh, okay. So, what that is, I can tell you what that is. That's our 1090 contribution. So state law requires when we bill, now we don't really bill the county because it's like billing ourselves, right? But the county is still required to pay into the equipment replacement fund. So that would be the 15% into the equipment replacement fund. You agree? I'm not looking at the same document, but from what it sounds like, it's the, it's the 1090 contribution That's that the correct. county would be required to pay due to them conducting an election. So every jurisdiction is required to pay a 15% um, on top of their election costs into this fund, and that's a state law. Right, so, so if the board should choose to run a criminal justice safety tax on the ballot, then from the general fund, we would pay into the election reserve. Okay, and then moving on. So I understand that then. And then 21, are we, do we have to deal with that now? Or are we going to deal with that with the clerk or? Deal with this with the clerk. Okay, so set it aside for now. Yep. That was the questions I had. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Gary. Uh, if you have any. Uh, yeah, Mary, you mentioned that you had to keep people in the office right up until 8 o'clock on election night to register. How long do they have to be in the state to register to vote? Uh, according to state law, 30 days. 30 days? Okay. Uh, it's, I think it's one year to get a fishing license, but that's nothing to do with this. Uh, how much was that 2% reduction that you got uh, in budget this year by the board? Uh, $73,950. Okay, and would, uh, if you were to get that money back, we wouldn't end up with it in the ending fund balance, but it would go back into your election uh, reserve fund, right? Is that it? 
Well, I think you will get it back in the yeah. uh, general fund because we budgeted for the election reserve fund. Well, yes, I mean, it, it would be an asset to us for sure, but I mean, it wouldn't automatically come back to ending fund balance. It would. Right. Well, okay. we actually severed a, a contract to give a large part of that back. So. Okay. Thank you. I'm very. Uh Early on in the presentation, you said we assisted, your office assisted the state with dis, uh, disability placards. Was that uh, at their request or did we offer and was that, did that generate revenue for us? That was at their request and no, it did not generate revenue. Um, <clears throat> but it created a lot of goodwill that is allowing us to be in a pilot project to remo uh, work remotely. Uh, with DOL, so. Good, uh, and yeah. I don't question, I don't question the judgment of helping. Yeah. Um, and I see the difference on B020, oh, I tie asked that already. And uh, you do have amazing staff. And I think Tilly did a presentation in Yelm. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? She did for National Voter Registration Day. That's what it was. And so uh, last Friday at the mayor's forum, uh, the mayor, uh, J.W. Foster would just highly uh just praising tilly up and down what a great job she did yep she's a rock so star yeah you have all your folks are rock stars thank you i have no other questions and doesn't look like the commissioners do all right okay then well thank you very much thank you um, and if you ever have any questions you know please reach out okay oh we will thank you mary i know you will okay Bye. All right. Thank you. Robin, do you have any, uh, or does any commissioner have questions for Robin? No, sir. Nope. Or staff? Nope. Okay. okay. Then I'll come around and pick up your worksheets and um, we will, tomorrow will be a regular board meeting day with agenda setting in the morning and the board meeting in the afternoon. And then we will pick up again on Wednesday and just checking the schedule. Wednesday morning is um, internal service. So human resources at nine, central services at 10, IT at 11, and in the afternoon, commissioner's office, non-departmental and other funds. So that's the day on Wednesday. Okay. Go ahead, Ty. Robin, can you, um, I'm supposed to hop on another meeting as uh, so, soon as possible. Could you swing by my office first to grab my sheet? I have a quick question for you and then I can. Yep, I'm on my on way. Thank you. All right, thank you. And then we're adjourning this meeting. Unless there's anybody, anybody else, anyone, anyone, anyone? No, thank you. No, thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>